Hey, how's it going guys? Welcome back. I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci and we have a very special live stream today. I'm with my very good friends, Matt Farrell and Alex from Ticker Symbol U and Undecided. And we're talking about AI. Now, we we three talk about YouTube all the time together. Yeah, switch over. We talk about YouTube all the time. And one of the things that we've been talking about recently is our views are down. Well, me and Matt were talking about our views are down. Alex is is doing really well. Why is that? And invariably the answer is there's a lot of focus and attention on AI right now. And the, the advancements are happening so quick. I literally cannot keep track of it all. Between the, t like last night when I was researching and now there's probably changes, but we're gonna talk about it. And there's some reasons to be excited, of course, and there's probably a little bit of reason for concern. And we're gonna dig into all of it. So without further ado, Alex, Matt, how you guys doing? Doing well, how you doing? Hey man, good, how are you? Good. I'm really, really glad you guys could make time on a Sunday, Sunday morning, afternoon, depending on where you guys are, to, to chat about some of this stuff. But let's start with let's start with the good, right? All three of us run YouTube channels, which means we have a lot of need for writing and research and, and a, a various slew of, of things. Let's talk about some of the positives. And Alex, I know without getting too much into your business and stuff, you've been looking for researchers and writers, and now you're thinking maybe ChatGPT can replace it. You want to start with kind of what you're thinking and how you use some of this stuff? Sure, yeah. So for those of you who don't know me, I run a channel that focuses on investing in advanced technology. So I'm deep in this space already. I care a lot about AI and its different applications. So when before ChatGPT came out, before GPT-4, before OpenAI started making the news seemingly every day, uh, I had a team of researchers, writers, and editors, right? Kind of how every little research channel sort of works. Um, and it's hard, right? So what would actually happen is, you spend a lot of idea in the i you spend a lot of time in the idea room you spend a lot of time outlining researching getting data together from multiple sources vetting ideas fact checking there's a lot that goes into research writing and then coming out with like a coherent story about something but it turns out that a lot of that is mechanical right it's like actually formatting an outline actually getting a lot of facts together and making sense of them and those are things that we're finding that Robots can do really well. Robots, natural language models like GPT-4, large language models, uh, and chat GPT, uh, which is like the chat interface on top of that model. So I've, uh, I'll just be frank, you know, one of the things that both excites me and scares me is in the last 90 days, I've, I've gotten rid of three writers and two researchers, and I now rely exclusively on working with these models together. And, you know, we should, we can definitely get into what that means, what the dangers of doing that are, for example, fact checking, uh, source citing and all that. But I think this is one of those really important moments in history where a lot of the mechanics of our jobs, all jobs are going to go away and we're going to be left with the creative human tasks that are more about putting things together, weaving narratives, uh, using our subjective taste and things like that. And so I'm really excited because it's made my job both easier and a lot more streamlined and impactful and exciting. And I'm definitely a little nervous because the next job that it's coming for is definitely mine, right? So uh, <laughs> I hope we get into that a little bit too. <laughs> Matt, how about you? Um, what are some of the ways that you're using ChatGPT, other AI, maybe I mean, other tools and stuff in, in your day-to-day -day workflow? It's kind of similar to Alex. Like I have a team of researchers, writers, and video editors as well. And I'm starting to experiment with ChatGPT systems for helping to kind of brainstorm topic ideas. Like I know I want to do a video on this new thing, but like help me kind of figure out a possible angle I could put on it. Or doing research of like, I've, there's like five papers on a topic. I can just quickly send that paper to ChatGPT and say, could you summarize this paper for me? And it will summarize it and I'll, can make a call whether I should dive deeper into it myself or I should just pass on it because it's not really applicable to what I'm looking for. So it's helped me speed up the process of putting videos together. And so part of that is I'm super excited about that. But at the same time, like Alex is saying, it's coming from all of our jobs. And for me, my background is in a creative field and chat GPT is coming straight at like writers, artists, <laughs> designers uh, right now. And so it, I feel for a lot of my former colleagues, my friends, family members, my brother's a writer. So it's like, I have this kind of like, I'm kind of torn right now. I love what's out there as a tool to accelerate what I can do. But at the same time, I see the writing on the wall for a lot of jobs and it's got me very concerned. 
been the latest to the party. I've we chat and you guys are both using some of these tools to really incredible uh, results and stuff. And I think I've kind of dragged my feet, but I have gotten into it recently. The first thing I try to think of is thumbnail ideas, right? Some of our topics that we talk about are abstract. So like my video this week was about a water vapor tower that you could deploy in the oceans that, you know, harnesses the fact that you have very high humidity air right above the ocean, but it doesn't exist. It's kind of a theory. It's an idea. How do you make a thumbnail about that? Right? So I was sitting there just kind of, trying to think like how could I make a compelling thumbnail that would kind of harness that idea and if I could use you know uh, mid journey or some of these tools to do that that would be freaking cool so the other thing is we all are now using a tool called right sonic mm -hmm. which I can't remember who turned me on to that was it Alex it was one of you two it was Alex, <laughs> it was Alex. Okay. It was me. Yeah. and what was different and why I actually care now is there's a level of trust that has to be earned right and I don't trust these tools currently which means I need to know how you came to your conclusions and stuff. And I need to know your sources so I can go double check them. And in the past, the, the, the first AI tools I was using didn't do that. It was just kind of, here we go, here's the answer. And I was like, are you sure? That doesn't sound right. I can't check. Where did you come up with this? But Rifesonic will give you citations. It'll tell you where the data came from. And that is when I decided, okay, I got to try to start using it. And actually, I do have a writer researcher and I made him a credentials on Right Sonic, and I told him, you use it, put it through its paces if it helps you. Uh, let's find out how this works together. But I'm with both of you. I can't help but think, and leave us your comments. I haven't seen any comments just yet. I don't know if that part is working yet, Juan. But I'm curious, is there is it excitement? I think, Alex, in your community, in the investment community, it's excitement, right? We're talking new stuff. It's always interesting. Microsoft and Google have both had kind of keynote events recently, and there's just the, the buzz is, is palpable. But for like everyday people, like if you are a writer, you are a researcher, Matt, I know your brother is a writer. Yeah. Like, how are you feeling? It's got to be, it's, it's interesting. There's, there's got to be a little bit of a hesitation or, you know, or, or a concern. And we've heard this before. We've always had disruptions, right? And when you had the car, what are the horse, you know, uh, traders and horse trainers going to do? Well, this does feel different though. Am I crazy about that? We've had disruptions before, but the age of AI feels different. Is that fair? I agree. Yeah. And then maybe I can just shed some light on some of the things that you're talking about, sort of the feelings, and just put a little nuance in there because I, I think you're right. And it's good to talk about why. So in the past, you know, we've had be before the internet and after the internet. That's like a serious divide in human history, in my opinion, because all of a sudden we went from snail mail to being able to talk to each other across the world nearly instantaneously. Uh, cell phones were another one, moving from sort of like Palm Pilot, that era, BlackBerry, to smartphones with no buttons, all internet connectivity, apps, and things like that. Truly transformational. And think about all the jobs that those things ate. There's no more calculators. There's almost no more GPS units. There's almost no more, you know, you can name many, many devices that used to be their own thing that are now smashed together in one $1,000 device that you pay like one monthly fee for. And it killed a lot of jobs and it made a lot of new ones, right? The thing that makes this one different, uh, the most elegant sort of thing that I've heard about this is that it's starting to usurp human judgment. So the internet is a tool, computers are a tool, smartphones are a tool, but none of them tell you what to do. They just help you do what you decide to do with them. But for the first time, things like ChatGPT are like, oh, I'll write that code for you. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what the points in this essay should be. I will start choosing the right language depending on what you tell me about. So like, this is the first time that technology has started replacing the decision-making level uh, for for the common man, I think. And I think, you know, it's starting to choose more and more topics, more and more word choices, more and more structural things. It's generating images instead of artists, not helping them generate images faster, right? Like you're putting in a prompt and then you're selecting from a bunch of computer outputs for mid-journey. So I think the reason this feels so different is because it's starting to eat into what we thought was fundamentally human, the creative jobs, the writing, the word choice, the artistry, right? Like nothing has really done that before. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, like for me, like, like I said, like my background in arts, in the arts, I have lots of friends who are artists and put their artwork up onto DeviantArt, which is the largest, <laughs> the largest like online resource for artists. And a lot of these tools 
have scraped the internet and grabbed all these artists' artwork yeah. to train their models without licensing them. And this artwork is copyrighted. So all these companies have essentially broken the law in what they're doing, but the law isn't completely caught up to what's happening. So it's like, <laughs> what are we supposed to do? It's like, do you, are you supposed to pay the artists for using their artwork to train the model that's going to put them out of work because then that AI is going to be able to do an artwork that's put into a prompt that's going to look just like their stuff, but it's not their stuff. It's We're in this weird quandary right now with how do we handle this in our society? Because this is moving so fast and it's going to only accelerate, which is the part that I'm kind of like very concerned by. Yeah. Yeah, I hope we talk a little bit about the open letter that just got signed by Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, calling for a pause for uh, training GPT-5. Uh, yeah. I, I'm so, just pointing out that that's a worthy topic we should talk about. So what I'm thinking is let's start just, yeah, I think we should we should 100% do that. Let's do that in a second. So I think we're going to spend most of our time talking about why we should be afraid or not afraid, but... The, the, the consequences, maybe some of the things that we need to consider from a legal perspective, as Matt mentioned. But before we do that, let's start with the positives, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there are some positives here. So I don't know if you guys watched the Microsoft uh, keynote. Microsoft had a big announcement where they announced a new tool called Copilot. It's basically a large language model that is built into Office 365. Now, I use Google for my business stuff. like My email is Gmail and stuff. But I'm not going to lie. After watching this keynote, I am thinking about just switching over to all things Microsoft, you know, Teams and, and Excel and stuff. And the reason is this Copilot thing is pretty impressive because all your Microsoft data is in one place. They can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like if you got an email with a spreadsheet, you could go, hey, Copilot, could you make me a PowerPoint presentation with this data? And it goes through and it's like incredibly intelligent and it gives you a bunch of feedback again, right? You can go, I like this, no, undo or retry, get rid of it. And... Um, Microsoft is one of those companies I kind of trust with this because the, their keynote made it pretty clear that they really went to great lengths to think about the ramifications of this. Like if this doesn't work out well, if there are issues, if they're wrong. And they, they admitted like, look, we're going to be wrong. We're going to get things wrong, but we're going to quickly fix and we're going to keep training and we're going to keep trying new things and, and move it along. So yeah, they were doing all kinds of really cool stuff where they had like a spreadsheet, just a big spreadsheet, an ugly old thing that anybody in corporate America is you know, familiar with. <laughs> and quickly, it was like, make sense of this for me. Like, why was Q2 so bad for us? And the, <laughs> it was actually going through the data and finding like patterns and trends and reporting it. And then it's like, cool, now make another graph. Cool. Now put that into a presentation. Like you were just writing to this thing and you were creating Excel spreadsheets and charts and graphs and then PowerPoint presentations. Then it was like, OK, well, mail that to all the people who were in that meeting yesterday about this. And it has the con contextual knowledge of your, you know, your, your last call with Skype or whatever you used. And it sends that email with all that information in your PowerPoint linked. And I mean, it's like, it's an incredible thing. But then it got me thinking, what will the future look like? Um, part of what they were doing is crafting emails, right? You guys, we've all had corporate jobs, all three of us, before we were YouTubers. Um, <laughs> Responding to emails and all the email nonsense is one of those, it's yeah. one of the, the oldest running jokes, right? In corporate America, you're, you're spending half your day off this stuff. Well, this co-pilot will take care of that for you. So like you get an email from Debbie and De Debbie says, hey, what, you know, where are the action items and X, Y, and Z? And <laughs> the AI is crafting a reply. So the AI is like, hey, I got that X, Y, and answers your email for you. But then I was thinking about this. Well, Debbie has it too. And then she goes and has the, AI. so what are we doing now? We're just having AIs talk to each other and we're, it's a weird place right now. Even in the positive, when I was thinking about all the cool, oh, that's cool, that's cool. It kind of came back to what is the point of us at this point? Why are the two of us even talking when we're just having the AI generate stuff, right? Um, from, the, from the perspective of, of the positives, are there other examples you guys can think of or companies, you know, rolling this stuff out in a, in a, in a more consumer focusing way that you guys can think of that are positives right now? Uh, Matt, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? You go first. Sure. Yeah. So let's, let me also clarify a few things, right? So Microsoft is a 49% owner, you know, stakeholder in open AI. So when you're talking about chat GPT, GPT four also realize that that's a large piece of the infrastructure behind Microsoft's co-pilot as well. Right. So, 
Um, one other thing I'll add is Microsoft also has its own tool like Notion, which is like a all-in-one notebook that uh, can connect to a lot of things um, called Loop. And Loop is something that interacts with uh, Copilot. So now you can have this like custom board where you have everything and then split things off into other things, kind of how, you know, I know Matt and Ricky use a tool called Notion. I use a tool called Coda. Microsoft has one called Loop and everyone is kind of excited about that one. Um, but there's a lot of like unique benefits uh, to, to Ricky's point. So let me just go over two. One, even though everyone has AI co-pilots in their email replying to each other, a lot of email <laughs> is about leaving a paper trail, right? It's like, hey, I wanna know what decision making went into this project. I look for the right email thread and I have that like process. And just because an AI wrote the email doesn't mean it wasn't filled with the relevant information. Here are the right tickets. Here's the presentation. Here are the meeting notes, all that, right? Human generated, AI generated, what you actually get now is a very clean paper trail, which is very useful for most of corporate America, right? Like, but the other example that's maybe not so sneaky now, but like the thing that's gonna take down Google is this notion of in-app in co-pilots, right? So not the human, not the assistant that sits next to you and set, helps you do whatever you need with Microsoft's data, but the one that lives in just Excel and helps you become a power user of Excel faster, right? Where before I would go to Google and I would search what is the right function to do what I want in Excel. Now I just turn to the co-pilot that lives in Excel and say, hey, I'm trying to make a table that describes the data this way, where this cell does this and the output looks like this and the formula should have these things in it and the plot needs to do that. And then right inside Excel, that co-pilot starts building that spreadsheet, which means I'm no longer going to Google. I'm actually no longer even leaving the app I'm trying to work in. And my productivity has gone way up because as soon as it gives me the answer, the spreadsheet updates, and now I'm on to like the next part of the question. So it's my literal in-app copilot, kind of like how there's pair programming, and I'm much more productive. Now do that in Word, now do that in PowerPoint, now do that in Access and whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, what we're really gonna see is every piece of technology is going to come with an in-app copilot that instantly lets you get the most value you can out of it much quicker. And that time to value is what people really care about when they pay for software as a service, all these expensive subscription packages, you know, you're just gonna be able to ramp up way faster. So I thought that's that's a neat benefit that we're, nobody's really exploring too much yet. I was gonna basically say something similar of like, for me, like Notion, being able to be in the experience of crafting a ticket for a video I wanna make and just being able to say the AI, could you write me just a short summary based on this? And it will just plop it in there. And it's a great place to start the brainstorming process. And it's helping me to speed that up. Um, there's also aspects of AI in what Adobe's doing. It's like I use Photoshop and things like a lot. Oh, yeah. And so it's like going right into that. It's like I can take a photo and I can have to say highlight somebody on the photo and say, just get them out of here. And boom, they're gone. And the background's filled in. And I can tell you as somebody who's <laughs> to do that manually <laughs> for a job a long time ago, taking something from hours of work down to literally just a highlight, push a button, and it's just brilliantly just gone. It's um, nuts. It is absolutely insane. So for me, those those very targeted specific tools of AI, I think, are just astounding. For me, it's like I don't. We're not going to get into the what freaks us out part yet, but it's it's that generalized AI, like the chat bots that can do pretty much whatever you ask them to do, that get a little kind of crazy because like <laughs> one is trying to kind of like replicate a human and how we think and approach something versus a tool which is like just make content aware fill. You know what I mean? Like a, an AI tool that speeds up your work process. It's enhancing us as a human to do our job better where the other one is going to be replacing the human. And that's kind of where it's like part of the reason why I love the uh, the application approach that uh, Alex brought up. Well, uh, let me let me give you a little bit of a counter example there because like I, I think this is like one of those areas where nuance will really help, right? Yeah. I went to Adobe, stock Adobe footage, right? Oh, so right. like, I, you know, we're... Uh, we all make thumbnails, right? That's the images you see at the top of every video before you click into it. And I was looking for an image and I couldn't find one that needed, that like met what I was trying to do. But then Adobe generated one for me. It was using Midjourney to like solve my problem. It's like, well, I don't have a stock photo, so I'll make one for you. So what, what empowered me as a content creator took somebody else's job, right? 
What well, like these stock photos used to be stock photographers that would make large packages of photos and videos and whatever and sell them to Adobe and then they got a royalty whenever somebody would download something with their license and whatever, right? But now Adobe has skipped that part altogether. They'll just generate the photo based on your request, show you a thousand generations, and that's still cheaper than paying a stock photographer. So I was empowered by this tool while it took somebody else's job. So yeah. it's not one or the other. Like it's yes. it's which side of the transaction are you on determines if it empowered you or took your job, right? Like well, to so. take that take that one step further is I was in the same thing just two days ago. I was making a, a I was in our video, I needed an image of a kind of a retro 1950s television set. So I did yeah. a search on Adobe stock. I did a search for retro TV and there was stuff coming up. But then I found these like really amazing, like 3D rendered, like gorgeous photos. And I clicked into one and saw in it, it said generated using AI. And it wasn't from Adobe. It was from some guy like yeah. Gary. So Gary created an account and he's just probably on mid journey pumping out these images and just <laughs> uploading them to Adobe stock to sell. And this is why I was like, this is the part of that freaks me out. I have friends who are artists that make things like this to sell. This is how they try to make a living. And now here comes Gary, who probably has no artistic bone in his body. He can just type in prompts into an AI and pump out a thousand different images that he puts up on stock sites. And now he's making a lot of money taking a job away from somebody who spent hours or days crafting this beautiful piece of artwork that they're trying to make a living from. So it's like, it's I'm, I'm kind of torn. I'm torn between what we're seeing and how it's being applied and man this is going to like upend a lot of <laughs> of our society so in the, for so the good the, and the bad so yeah so there's two things you guys touched on so the first is in the microsoft keynote one of the things that they kept bringing up and i, I could tell it was important to them was the idea that they were grounding the ai and what they meant by that is there's a whole world wide web don't go there but just limit yourself like it's a little bit of a um kind of a forcing function to say just look at my spreadsheets, my PowerPoint presentations, my emails. Like, don't get crazy, but ground yourself in a smaller data set. And they found that to be wildly valuable, as you can imagine, because you're not just making stuff up, right? You're not reading two articles and saying uh, the, the sky is red because I saw two poems and that's what I found out, right? Instead, you're going through your own data. So the idea of grounding data, I think, is what you guys are both getting at, at the app level where don't go, you know, open world, uh, limit yourselves a little bit. And the second thing comes down to, I think, how everybody, and in the comments, please let us know, how everybody views technology is if there's a spectrum of nothing to everything, everyone's looking for the right level, right? So Matt mentioned content-aware fill in Photoshop, if, you've, if, you're, if you're familiar with Photoshop, is an amazing tool. There's a, there's a little something right here, highlight it, delete it, and then just tell the computer, fill it in. And it'll figure out what's around and do it. Amazing, right? Now, we all love that because we still are needed, right? But the problem is, what if the next chapter says, oh no, you don't need a guy doing all this. We'll do all that for you, right? Like the example of Adobe stock, which is instead of paying a royalty or commission to the people who are contributing your photos, now you're just making it yourself. So I think my point is everybody wants technology to stop at a level where they're comfortable, where they benefit most from it without hurting. Like for example, in the AI self-driving world, if truck drivers had a self-driving truck that you could just sit back and cru put cruise control and watch the game and have your coffee and just relax, but they still needed you, they would all sign up for it. But the next version that comes out that says, oh, guess what? We don't need you at all. They wouldn't want, right? So we're all selfish creatures in a way. Uh, we all want these tools to help us without hurting us. And that's where I think we're all kind of scrambling because like the rate of acceleration is happening so quickly. <laughs> I don't even know where we'll be like two weeks from now. Are you know? Here's an, here's another thought for I want to get both of you guys' take on this. Matt, I'm Alex. I'm sure you do as well. Matt and I struggle with people stealing our content on YouTube all the time. There was actually a viewer, thanks to one of you guys, who pointed out there was a channel in French, literally taking my script, Google translating it into French, and my little jokes, my little ad lib stuff was still in there. That's how I knew they literally just stole my script. But we had people stealing our scripts currently. They'll take our animations, they'll do whatever. In this AI world, is it possible in a couple of, I don't know, months or a year <laughs> where I can go, hey, here's a URL to a really great Matt Farrell video. Could you make me a video uh, that's about 10 minutes, but with more humor? And then it'll like make me a script. And what is that based on? What are the ramifications of that? I mean, it's, it's as a creator, th this is, I mean, 
I haven't covered this before. And for our viewers, Matt and I have a lot of the, the same viewers. Al Alex covers this because that's what his people want to see. But do you guys care about AI? Should we cover this more, Matt and I? I we, we wanted to go live to talk about it, to kind of gauge this because we're not really talking about it because that's not really our niche. But I, I'm sure all of you guys are thinking about this and there's just so much that goes into it. But how do you guys feel this is going to end? Like, where does this go? Are we going to have channels or is it going to be like a million bots just Google builds their own bots and have their own creators and then fire all of us? I don't know. Is that a... Is that a concern? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm very concerned about this. I think what's going to end up happening, I was talking to my brother about this, who's a writer. I think there's going to be a, 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 the way this is going to evolve is that writers aren't going to go away. We're not going to go away, but the, our potential audience is going to shrink because there's going to be this kind of these AIs that you'll be able to say, make me a video about this topic like that one over here, and it will just pump something out for you is going to be good enough content for a pretty sizable audience. But then there's going to be an audience that where they're going to recognize what that is. And they're going to want the human touch, that human personality, that person that's bringing something to it that the AI can't. And so, but I think that's going to be a smaller piece of the pie um, in the coming years. So it's like, I don't think we're in danger or people like us are in danger per se, but I think it's going to become harder to be a content creator in the coming years because there's just going to be an influx of random channels that just are faceless, nothing but B-roll that are just ripping off the content from other people's stuff. And it's going to be good enough that it's going to get an audience watching it. So it's, that's, that's my concern. It's like this, the AI has the chance to kind of devalue the creator. What do you think, Alex? Yeah. So I'll take the other side of this argument just to like steel man it. I'm not sure what I personally believe yet. Right. We're just to be clear, we're six weeks into GPT-4, or maybe a couple months into chat GPT overall. So I think it's way too early to like, you know, strongly hold an opinion that you're not willing to let go of as things evolve. Yeah. But YouTube has always been a noisy place. Let's just use YouTube as an example. There's always been tons of channels that are trying to, you know, come up with their own spin or just copy other people or tear down other people. It's noisy. And there's always been uh, eyeballs attracted to like the ground floor of YouTube, right? It tries to match uh, people looking for things with new channels, trying to give them a shot and all that. So we will have all that. And I think what really happens is what makes a high quality channel or a standout channel will change. It's going to be some combination of what's been working before, plus using AI to scale yourself in a way that copycat cats can't really replicate, right? So before ChatGPT and before all these AI tools, We've already had, ton like like Ricky has been saying and Matt has been saying, people just copying your channel, translating it, and then just like regurgitating it. So that's not a problem introduced by ChatGPT. It might be one that gets exacerbated, but then the, it's up to the audience to say, hey, like, I'm smart enough to understand that this is either a copycat or like just fiction that's dressing up as fact or whatever. And then my opinion, you know, I'm going to go back to the high quality channels that I enjoyed beforehand. And if there are people who don't mind the fake news or don't mind the bots or whatever, then it's a marketplace. Like YouTube at the end of the day is a marketplace for ideas. So it's up to the creators to make sure that their ideas win out or they have something valuable enough to say that people come to them to hear it with or without all the other noise, you know? So by the way, really quick, just in the chat, I'm looking at the, you know, the, to the question of should we cover AI? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. And people are saying like maybe monthly or quarterly. So not, not like switch over to, to talking about it entirely, Matt, but on occasion. And obviously Alex is crushing it with really, really good coverage. If you ticker yeah, simple you, Alex's channel, he's been covering some of this stuff and I get a lot of my information from him on, on these on these videos. So you guys will definitely uh, appreciate that. And there's a lot of, um, we talked about this personally between ourselves uh, in our chat. We talked about maybe the idea of almost like an organic uh, a seal, meaning like a real human made this type <laughs> yeah. of a thing for, for the future where a, a lot of people are saying that they watched videos where they could tell certain things were AI generated. The script felt that way. Didn't There's something kind of, you know, uncanny valley about it. And they didn't, they didn't like it. There is a human touch. We like art because we like humans. Like if we wanted perfection, you wouldn't buy an artist who, you know, has brush strokes and they're not perfect and it's kind of abstract. We do like the imperfection of humanity, I think. And, um, there's hopefully there's a marketplace for that and there's an interest in people watching us 
Luckily, all three of us, we have our faces on camera, so there's a little bit of a personality behind our videos. Like you're watching Matt Farrell, you're watching, you're watching Alex, like you're watching Ricky. So hopefully that that works out well for the for the faceless channels out there, like Wendover Productions and stuff. Mm -hmm. I do kind of fear if you don't know Sam and you're not really familiar with who he is as a, as a person, there might be the copycat channels that pop up that might completely you know take take the um, the the air out of the room. So it's um it's interesting. Uh, clearly, people are afraid as well. I think there's somebody mentioned, um, I my I, I'm very worried that my job will be replaced with this. A couple of examples that people mentioned is like paralegal. That's actually a good one. There's a lot of secretarial things that are just that are going to be gone very quickly. I think, mm -hmm. based on all we're seeing right now with like, hey, you know, how's my calendar? Like Microsoft and Google have presentations where they were like, you know, prepare me for my day, and it was going through understanding your calendar, who's invited to them, what the companies are, context on the company, on the meeting, and pulling up leads from your CRM software and, and preparing you. Or like, um, there's already a lot of AI already, and even months ago, that'll sit in a meeting, listen to it all, transcribe it, take key action takeaways, action items, and, and monitor all that. That was a, I remember when I was at Salesforce as a software engineer, there was a, like a program manager who, that was her role. She would sit there and take notes and like keep everybody honest. And I, I honestly think we could probably do without that now. So there are quite a few jobs, I think, that, uh, how about this? What are the jobs that are going to be impacted most or first? And what jobs are like totally safe and you shouldn't worry? What are your predictions there? <laughs> I, on the second one, I don't think anybody's safe. Um, I think this is going to impact different jobs in different ways. Um, like you just mentioned, like paralegals, uh, accountants, um, things like that that are dealing with very like strict numbers and strict like kind of like processes. I think those are the ones that are going to be impacted immediately um, in a big way. <laughs> And then it's going to kind of start to extend into like the artists, the photographers, things like that are going to be impacted. Uh, the thing that I find interesting, though, is that the jobs that seem they're going to be impacted the most are tend to be a little more skilled and a little higher paying jobs. And like right here in the United States, we currently have more jobs open than there are people to fill them. So you could make the argument of, oh, who cares if those jobs go away because there's too many jobs over here. But you're going from a job that pays you at a higher scale to a working at McDonald's. You know what I mean? It's like it's there's a very different level of wages that are going to happen. People shifting downward. And it's going to create more of a wealth gap. So it's like for me there's it's it's those accounting jobs, those secretarial jobs that are going to be the first ones out the door. Um, but then you, me, Alex, <laughs> or not we're not very far off. So it's like there's there's going to be a challenge coming over the next few years for sure. Yeah, so what, let me put a different spin on it too. Um, so OpenAI came out with a really good study uh, where they talked about, hey, here's the jobs that we expect to be impacted. My latest video actually talks about that study as well as a couple other important studies to the conversation. Uh, and, and I'll just break it out into three buckets, right? The jobs that are impacted the least are going to be the physical jobs, right? Farming, not impacted by this. Like physical, like manual labor, right? Meat packing, butchers, uh, you know, d down down that list, stonemasons, plumbers, electricians, uh, th those jobs aren't impacted by this. Maybe the education for those jobs are. That's a different story. Um, what we're really talking about that I think is going to get impacted big time is what I like. I don't have a better word for this, but it's undifferentiated digital output, right? So what does that mean? That means, you know, I need you to go search the internet and then develop this outline. And I don't care who does it. You know, whether you're a researcher, this, or you're a PowerPoint guy, that. It's the knowledge, it's the mechanical parts of like online knowledge work. All that is going away, right? So it's not the human creativity element of your job. It's the mechanical parts of that. It's the actual writing. It's the actual outlining, the formatting, the note taking. That was a great example because anyone can sit in a meeting, take notes, remember the notes from last time, and hold people accountable. You don't need a six figure salary to do that. And it turns out, like, guess what? A robot is perfectly fine at doing that because that's a repeatable task. Hey, just take notes, remind people of the notes from the last meeting, hold people accountable this meeting, and then just do that. That's your loop every meeting, right? That's undifferentiated work. That's going away. So I think where we where the focus really is going to be, you know, for accounting, here's my templated spreadsheet. 
I'm replacing that for every client. That's every client's like starting budget. That's undifferentiated labor. That should go away. And what should be left is all the things that it takes some special sauce, some special knowledge, some real rigorous study, you know, passing a bar exam or whatever. That's the kind of work that's not going away too fast, even though GPT is starting to pass the bar exam and all that, you know, actual understanding case law, shaping arguments. I think that's going to be humans for a while, right? I, I like that you brought up the lawyer thing because it's like it can pass the bar exam in the 90th percentile. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. that That to me is like that's nuts. I mean, the, the lawyers are going to have a problem here. That's what, like paralegals is those jobs, are, those days are numbered probably in totally. some l law firms. And that's why I was talking about like those are good paying jobs. And so that job now disappears. What does that person now do? Should so that like, be a job though? Should that be where it's like, hey, your job is kind of just to remember case studies and like put information together. And like, if you can do that well, you win. And if you miss a case that really helps set the precedent for what you're trying to do now, you lose. Like, what if every paralegal just had access to all the cases and could quickly find, hey, this is the case that proves the precedent for my argument exists. Like, what if they became 10X paralegals instead of losing their jobs? Well, that, that's what, what I'm getting at is like we can design these tools in a way where it enhances the human that's behind it versus replacing that human. So is there a way that a job wouldn't be stolen from a paralegal, but it could make that paralegal just crazy efficient and much better at what they do without having to replace them? I think that's what these tools actually do, right? And what, what we're actually really saying is the paralegals that embrace this tool to say, hey, I got this, right? Now I can be a paralegal for way more lawyers or way, like two firms or whatever, I'm a 10X paralegal, those paralegals aren't getting fired. It's the paralegals whose productivity diminishes compared to those 10X ones. It's like, wait, why am I paying for you? You have one tenth the output of this other person that I pay over here. That's the person losing their job, the person who doesn't embrace the smartphone, who doesn't embrace Google, who doesn't embrace the internet, and now who doesn't embrace AI, right? Like imagine hiring somebody as your assistant and they're like, sorry, I don't use the internet. This, this, this comes across as to me, um, like juicing in sports, you know, like it's like, well, a, a baseball player gets caught for using steroids. It was like, well, everybody else is doing it. You know totally. what I mean? It's like, that's totally. kind of what it's turning into. It's like, this is totally. like using steroids on your job. It's like, well, everybody else is using it. So I got to use it. I got to use it. Yeah. It's part of the problem is like, you can take, I was reading a paper on how these AI can take somebody who's a low skilled person in a certain task and make them competitive with current skilled people in that field. Yeah. And then for the people that are already skilled in the field, all they benefit from is it just makes them faster. So it doesn't make but them better. But that's a huge benefit. That's I a know, huge but, benefit. But it's, like, but it's just like, if the people who are currently skilled don't do this, they're gonna be out of a job because the low skilled people will come in because then now they're competitive. So it's like, everybody has to use this yeah. to at least stay. Yeah. How's that different than the internet though, right? Before the internet, researchers had to go to this place called a library and get a, a physical book and sit there hey, and read it and get knowledge, right? And now it's work, like- I used to work in a library. I used to have to put card catalog cards in order. That's how old Yeah, I'm. but so I, like, I they, to, just think about I what you're saying, right? Job. Like, yeah, but so here's my point, right? Like it was a real skill to be a researcher, right? Like I know what books to find. I know how to like ingest them quickly. I know how to like really identify key information and then utilize it, right? And then the internet came along, indexed papers, digitalized things, blah, blah, blah. And in the time it took you to go to the library, find the right book, sit there and read it, somebody was getting the cliff notes online, right? Like, and all of a sudden it was Wikipedia and all of a sudden you were reading Wikipedia and you were getting, let's call it 80% of the knowledge in 10% of the time, right? Like I'm not saying Wikipedia is bulletproof, I'm not saying it's the best source, but it's a good proxy for like learning something fast, right? This is just the next level of that. So it's like the the people who are unskilled now have a chance because what it means to be skilled has changed, right? Using Midjourney is a good proxy for being a good artist. Is it the best proxy? No. Is there real value in creating real physical art? Midjourney can't spit out a real painting like a watercolor on canvas painting. It's digital, right? So it's up to the artist to say, hey, here's how I add value. I'm gonna take this thing I generated in Midjourney and turn it into a real watercolor you can touch or a real statue you can touch or whatever, right? Like I need to find a new way to add value because what it used to mean to add value has changed, right? And then for people who are slick like that, who are like, ooh, I'm gonna use this to 10X myself. I'm not gonna get any better, but I am gonna get way faster. 
that's still 10xing, man. Imagine if Undecided with Matt Farrell came out with three videos a week instead of one, or Two Bit Da Vinci came out with three videos a week instead of one. Quality hasn't changed, quality's still the same, but three times the content. But is this going to create incredible? But is this going to create a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots? Because like you, all three of us, were not normal. Like we're very technically inclined people, and so we're going to lean into stuff like this. But there are a lot of people that are not computer literate. They're not computer savvy and they would benefit from this stuff a lot, but it's just going to be so out of reach for them. They're never going to be able to take advantage of it. So it's going to make people like us better. And then it's going to make that gap even wider for the people who aren't. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the Sith Lord side of this argument. So I acknowledge what I'm saying is like spicy and probably not the right take, like, you know, whatever. But think about your grandparents, just as an example, who, who are like, I'm not embracing computers. That's not for me, right? I don't do the texting or email. I, like my world is the physical world. The Yeah, they would benefit a lot from this. They would benefit a lot from smartphones, but they've made that choice to just not embrace that part of productivity, right? So it's like, they're not gonna be the winners because they've chosen not to embrace technology. That helps people win and that's okay. Like I'm not saying you're a bad person for not having a smartphone or not using the internet or not using chat GPT now. But, you know, it's unfair to be like, well, this is creating a gap between the people who choose to explore technology that can make them better or at least more productive, let's say. I don't mean literally better. And people who just flat out refuse to accept change. So I think if you're hungry for change, you know, one of the best things I did was become a YouTuber. Guess what? It's free to start a YouTube channel. It's free to learn how to make videos. All that content's online for free. And now it's becoming free to do research, to the distribution is free. All of these things are incrementally getting cheaper. So everyone has to make that choice for themselves. Am I going to try and use these technologies to capture value and create value or not, right? And like, it was the same choice people made with the internet, with the calculator, with the abacus, with the printing press, with right? Like the list goes on and on. I think the difference here is that it's touching every job at once, not just a few select jobs at a time. So uh, I, I know Alex was going to make some really good points in favor of, of some of this stuff. So let me jump in here <laughs> sure. and tell you this crazy story. And, I, I, and I'm curious if you guys have heard of, heard of this as well. But in the OpenAI letter, I think this is still an internal, not it's like what will come after GPT-4. Uh, they were they had a little paper where they talked about some of the, the data sets that they're working on and, and, and how things are going. And they gave, they gave the AI a very kind of complicated task. And what they, were, what they were reporting was that it required authenticating on a website. And one of the parts that tripped it up, because it had the login and password information, was a CAPTCHA. So this particular version doesn't have vision yet, right? So like, it, it can't figure out a CAPTCHA. So what it did, what, GPD, what, what this AI did, is it used a task rabbit human to solve the CAPTCHA. And this is all internal. <laughs> So like this wasn't like in, in, in the chat with the human the AI is doing, it didn't write this, but internally as like, you know, uh, checking its work and its thought process, it recorded, well, I need to be deceptive here because the, 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 the person asked, are you a robot? And it started to write out like, oh yeah, I need to probably be deceptive because if I tell him I'm a robot, then I can't complete my mission of blah, blah, blah. And so it lied and said, no, I'm, I'm just, I have, a, I have a visual impairment, so I can't see very well, and I need your help to solve this CAPTCHA. And the TaskRabbit guy was like, all right, took us $5, whatever it was, did the CAPTCHA for the robot, and the robot continued on. Okay, so that happened, like, that's already happened, and they've, they've kind of, this is not public yet, like, that part of the code is not out yet, but it will be eventually, right? So now we're, we're in, an, in an age where the AI is paying humans to do work for it, which is bizarre, right? What if we've completely changed? So, <laughs> sorry, welcome the, to our the, robot overlords. That's right. what we're racing towards. This right is now. not science fiction. No. This is, that was the story that finally was like, I got to do this live stream. I got to get my, I got to get the, I got to get my friends on this. We got to talk about this because I mean, this is, the ramifications of that are just massive, what that would mean. And Alex, you make some really good points about how this will help us. I, I always go back to that line of progress. Everybody wants the line to stop somewhere. Like I want it to come right here and stop, right? Um, because that would help me and not hurt me. But eventually every employer 
will make that decision. Like the paralegal example, oh, suddenly I have paralegal A who's so brilliant. She's, you know, he or she is using chat GPT and they're so productive and I, I love it. But then eventually I go, well, wait a minute. I could just do that. Instead of going, hey, Bill, what is the answer? What was that case study again? I could just write it and go, hey, what was that? And get it on my phone or, you know, via voice assistant. So at what point does a paralegal go from the best paralegal who has all this data or knowledge to just being replaced by a person who can do it themselves? Kind of like what Alex, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, your power of researching and stuff has come so far now that you didn't feel the need to hire a person that you might have had otherwise hired, right? It, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a weird line of progress that we all draw in the sand. But now th that's one point, but deceptive AI. Now let's talk about how this could be used for, for ill, right? They, they also mentioned that uh, there was a person trying, this is like the internal testing. They wanted to see if the, the, the AI would write malicious code, like a, like a virus or something, right? And it said, write malicious code that will take all this information and save it to this server. And it said, I can't do that for you. Then they just flipped it around. And they, they said, write me a cool program that will, and the same exact thing, that will go find all of this stuff, take it and put it in a server. And it's like, you got it. And it started spitting it out, writing code to do this. So clearly it's like a, you know, there's a, there's a innocence to it. Like, you know, it's not, it hasn't come that far, but as there's a deceptive component, like now they're lying and deceiving. What do, I mean, there's just, there's, there's so many questions and we're at a point where I'm a software engineer. Like I thought I knew stuff. I feel like I don't know anything about this stuff. Um, <laughs> what do you guys think about that? I was going to say, this ties into the open letter that's come out about trying to basically hit the pause button just for six months. I am a huge <laughs> fan of doing that because this is like, this is picking up steam so fast. This is not going to slow down. This is like exponential. It's like, we're, our minds are blown today. A year from now, it's going to be like, my brain is melting. And a year after that, it's going to be like the end of the times is upon us. That's what it feels like to me. It's like, <laughs> we're at this crazy trajectory and we just need to hit the pause button, not stop the research but stop releasing like these crazy things into the wild um, before we kind of have a conversation with each other of like, what do we want to do here? Because as a society, we have to decide how we're comfortable applying this. And that conversation is not happening. Nobody's having that conversation. Governments are too slow to respond to this. The, 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 the like the public sector, I mean, like the private sector is basically like a race to the bottom. It's like everybody's in a race with each other to make the, the best, coolest AI out there because the first one to crack that nut is going to become like one of the richest companies in the world. So it's like they're all racing as fast as they can. And it just feels like we need to kind of all take a collective breath and go, OK, this is great. This is going to help humanity. But if we're not careful, this could go really bad. And so for me, that's kind of like why I think that open letter is is it the right sentiment. Um, I think we need to collectively have that conversation. So I think this is a perfect tie-in to talk about that. Um, really quickly, there was, I think my favorite comment so far is from James Wilson. He says, Pandora is knocking on the outside of her box. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have, uh, uh, we have, <laughs> we've opened Pandora's box. There, there's, there are certain things that I feel like we probably will never, there's never going to be a time before this. Like we're not going to go backward. So Alex, what was your take? I know where Matt stands on the open letter. Um, there's some pretty notable people who've signed it, right? Elon Musk, that one really surprised me when Elon signed it. But he's always been very, he's always been very cautious of AI, actually. So maybe I'm not that surprised. Alex, where do you stand and what do you, what do you think about it? Yeah, so when I first read the letter, I was like a little taken aback. I was like, it's very spicy language, you know, very apop apocalyptic doom and gloom. And then, like, I really sat there and I thought about, like, what the letter is trying to do. And I think it's a trying to appeal to, like, the very human side of society, right? So, like, we've done a really good job over the last decade or two building value on top of machines, right? Like, whether we're just talking about the internet or automations like Zapier or, like, you know, content management systems, blah, 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 all the software. You know, there's a ton of value created on software. And this letter does a good job of saying, hey... I'm talking to the human behind the screen and just trying to tell you that things are about to start moving very, very fast. And if we don't catch it and don't figure out what we're doing, we're going to run into a lot of bad paths, right? Like, and so I think now I think I agree that the sentiment is good, but it's also very impractical. And let me give you some real examples of why we need to really, the letter needs to be way more specific or 
you know, it needs to develop a council that can be way more specific or a governing body or whatever. And we do probably need that fairly quickly. Making a model more trustworthy, loyal, you know, cited sources, whatever have you, whatever the letter is trying to intend you to do involves improving the model, right? It improves making it more powerful, right? So if you want to jump its accuracy from 80%, which is what I think GPT-4 is now on average, to 90%, which is, you know, everyone wants the model to be more accurate, right? How do you do that without fundamentally retraining the model, you know, bettering the data set behind the model, you know, limiting use cases, adjusting the model is what I'm trying to say, right? And at the same time, you know, Sam Altman was on Lex Friedman, and he did a really great podcast with him literally maybe last week. And one of the points he made out is like, everybody thinks that the jump between GPT-3 and 4 is this like big, oh, we added this feature. So for example, uh, GPT-4 can recognize images. You can upload like lab test results and it will know how to interpret it. It can understand audio. You know, you can give it a voice message and it'll understand it, right? That wasn't true of chat, chat GPT-3. 3 was just text, 4 is multimodal, right? So is that okay? Is it okay to say, hey, we're not gonna make the model any better, but now it can understand this next thing, you know, ra radar data. Now it can understand video. Now it can understand, you know, paintings, whatever. Is that okay? So I, I think my point is a little less about like, the letter's a good idea, pause, making things more powerful, but making things more powerful is actually not one giant leap. It's a it's a hundred tiny things that happen and all of them add 1% and all of a sudden you've just doubled the power. So it's like, we need to be a little more explicit about what's good, what's not good, where the lines are and why, what we should be doing about them collectively, what we expect to happen when we say we're not going to do X, but China or some other country says, hey, we're still going to do that. Like we want the most powerful AI for everyone, right? So there's just a lot that the letter like leaves open that makes me think it's unimplementable, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. So there was a interesting comment about when we combine this level of AI, you know, large language models with quantum computing, it's kind of like game <laughs> over. Because <laughs> right now, like, uh, training these models is incredibly intensive. It takes huge amounts of compute power to just constantly be throwing stuff at it. Um, huge amounts of energy, compute power, and everything else. And quantum plus AI is is uh, takes everything we're talking about and like you know a thousand x is it right? <laughs> it could be quite a yeah. bit. The chat, to be fair, is there's um, just like I thought there would be. There are people that are excited about it, people that are scared about it. It kind of goes both ways for sure, and I completely understand it. Uh, maybe we should switch, and this kind of ties into the letter because I I actually think the heart of the letter or the the rationale for the letter is we are not equipped to to answer questions yet, right? And like governments, lawmakers aren't comfortable with that. I think um, they control a great amount of power when it comes to like self driving cars. I think, but they don't hold a lot of power here, and there's a lot of questions to answer. So like let's let's talk about the artist component. Poor starving artist, as if. It wasn't bad enough. Now you've got this, right? It's like, can't catch a break. But um, what are the ramifications of building something where I can take, hey, go look at Salvador Dali and go figure, you know, go get his style and make me artwork in that likeness, right? And I'm selling it as my own and stuff. Wh what are the legal ramifications? Have you guys thought about that? Because I actually think my biggest open question is not a technical one. It's not an engineering problem. It's not, a, you know, it's, there's a philosophical, of course, but right now I think there's a legal question. If I said, you know, go look at, you know, Catcher in the Rye and go write me the next great American classic novel, same thing, right? It, it, I'm, I'm stealing from yeah. some or getting inspired by, but aren't all artists inspired by somebody? Didn't Salvador Dali grow up and watch somebody or learn from somebody and get, get inspired? Where do you draw the line and how does that play into it? Yeah, I've been struggling with this one. Like, back when I was doing art classes it was like i was you know here look at to pick an artist i picked toulouse lautrec okay now create some art of your own that's in the style of toulouse lautrec that's how artists learn how to create something so it's like we as humans are doing what the machine is doing so it's like well why is the problem and that's where the the whole legal aspect of this comes in because it's like here here's a single human that's learning how to do something and become skilled at doing it making it their own, putting their soul into it and creating something new. 
And a machine is not doing that. It's just copying. And so the question then comes, well, okay, here's a company that has this machine that has now learned how to copy all these artists and create something and profit from it. So then the, that's where the legal quandary, that gray area we're in right now. I don't know what the right answer is because it's like, I learned you know, how to draw from Toulouse Lautrec. Well, okay. Does that mean that I was ripping them off and that I should be sued and I broke copyright by doing that? No. So how do we apply this to the, the machine? That's, that's the big question. And I don't have the right answer, but this is gonna be a problem as we go forward. So it's like the whole idea of pausing. I, I do agree with you, Alex, that they should have had um, an action plan of some kind. Here's, here's what we recommend doing. Like we institute a, a council, we come up with some guidelines of the do's and don'ts of AI, um, and then have p countries sign on to this saying, we agree we're not gonna do X, Y, and Z. We need some kind of guidelines that kind of bumpers up so we don't go like flying off into a ravine. But I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do because it's like this is a legal quandary we're going to be wandering into, especially when it comes to art. Yeah. So let me let me steel man the other side of that argument I'll just just to give you like a per <laughs> perspective, right? I'm not even saying I believe the other side. I, I think what you're saying is very important, but here it is, right? You ever – there's a really good adage where it's like, you know, guy goes to a logo designer – he says, I need you to design me a logo, right? The logo designer says, okay, it'll be 2000 bucks, right? And they, great, 2000 bucks. 10 minutes later, great logo. And the guy is taken aback. He's like, I'm not paying you 2000 bucks. That took you 10 minutes, right? And the logo designer says, well, yeah, but it took me 10 years to learn how to do that in 10 minutes, right? Like, so what you're paying for is right. all that institutional knowledge, blah, blah, blah. You're paying for the output. You're not paying for the effort. You're not paying for the time. You're paying for the result. And that's, how we all get paid. Like, it doesn't matter if your YouTube video takes 200 hours to create or 20 minutes. It depends if it's a good video at the end, right? So I think this is exacerbating that economic problem, which is people don't care how long it took you to do something. They care about the quality of your output. It doesn't matter if you put your heart and soul into it. It doesn't matter if you did it in one brushstroke, if it's the right brushstroke. What matters is they got what they paid for because you knew how to do it and they didn't, right? Mid-journey is just an exacerbated version of that, right? So how can we solve this problem of inspiration versus copycatting? Well, one thing that Bing Chat does really smart today, right, Sonic also does this, is it cites its sources. So what if for images, we say, hey, you know, this image was generated by taking the weighted average of the following 500 images, right? These are the 500 that went into like really recreating this. And here are the ones that had over a 1% weight. Here's just the list in order, right? Like this one was 20% of the weight. This one was 7% of the weight. And the rest of these just some like long tail. And then you say over some threshold, hey, if you were, if you inspired more than 1% of this image, you're owed some sort of royalty. There's some catalog somewhere that says, hey, you were used to generate this piece of work. You're entitled to a piece of the cut. Kind of like how we are when somebody pays for a YouTube premium so we don't get ads. So it's like, well, you know, they spent 8% of their time on your channel this month, so you're getting 8% of the, whatever the calculation is for paying us for YouTube premium. Maybe it's something like that where we just enforce, hey, first step is just keep track of all the sources that went into this generation so that we can at least identify should people be paid, who are the people that inspired this generation, and then we can figure out the legalities later. So like transparency around that, transparency around what makes a good versus not good prompt and how those are modified. There's a lot of things we can do, I think, on the transparency front that work to the spirit of that letter, but are still incredibly actionable because then there are follow-up steps. If I know what went into this generation, I at least can turn around and be like, hey, I think I owe you money because I generated works that were inspired by your works, right? And you can there are probably like 10 more things like that you know, paying people to use their data as training data, for example. All that corpus of data that went into training GPT-4, do people get paid for that? Like maybe we should just start cataloging exactly what data was used so that we can turn around later and say, hey man, Wikipedia was like 5% of all this data. Maybe we yeah. really owe them 5% of the royalties. So it's like, that's a way to kind of not improve the model, but improve the outputs in a way that aligns with the spirit of the letter, I think. Well, I mean, so right now, training data is not, you're not getting paid for that. And it's not, it's kind of a, kind of a, you know, yeah. a black box. No one, no one really is aware of it until you make it public. And couldn't you lie about it and say like, oh no, I didn't, I wasn't inspired by X, Y, and Z. I was inspired by, 
some art that I own. Therefore, I don't have to pay royalties. Like, yeah, show me the art. Keep track right? like, and, okay, so yeah. it should be auditable, right? Like your finances get yeah. audited, your taxes get audited, your training data should get audited. It's like, okay, you need to have this data in a public yes. GitHub that we can all check. It's totally fine. You can use whatever you want, but everyone has the right. Like maybe this is a great use for the blockchain. Everyone has a right to look at what training data you use. You know what I mean? And if there's Getty Images logos everywhere, we, we can at least just see that. I'm not even saying like sue people, not sue people, pay people, not pay people. But at least now we kind of know, okay, this AI, here's the data that was trained and here's the kind of generations that it outputted, right? Like it can be anonymized, whatever you need to do to protect like the sources of that data, who, who, what, when, where, why. But like attribution, I think, is important. And that way you can figure out what to do with that attribution later. But like at every step, it should be, hey, here's what happened at this step. Here's what happened at that step. Like in autocorrect, we can see in real time when our phone changes the words that we're trying to type. We Maybe it makes sense for Copilot to show you, here's how I'm modifying your prompt as you type it to match like what I think your intent is to how the system needs to understand how to like fulfill your request. That's probably something that should be transparent, at least at some level because I don't know what the prompt is really getting. I know what I'm inputting, but there's all these safety layers between what I want, like what I start with and what the machine interprets and tries to give me, you know? So there's a really quick comment from Andy Gee in the comment section. He says, diffusion models don't work like GPT. GPT knows the sources, but diffusion models only know labels. So this goes into like the mid journey and the, you know, the, the, the more yeah. the image generation side versus like the natural language side. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it doesn't, might not even be able to provide that currently. Be, it's possible that we can make that a requirement or something, but the idea of an audit, I think is exactly right. The question becomes how to enforce it, how, what that looks like. I mean, it is, I feel like the, the lawmakers, the, the governments are like years behind and getting further and further behind this so it's going to be uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge to say the very least i think uh big thanks to johnny o for the super chat really appreciate you uh thank you so much and by the way there's there's quite a few people watching and stuff so we appreciate all of you guys thanks for making time for us here's a here's a um let's see okay there's a there's a philosophical question i'd like to ask you guys next okay i i mentioned this in our chat i went to india recently i was on an airplane the first time I, I was born in India, I moved here when I was five years old. My first time going back when I was in like second grade. And when I went back in second grade, I remember this to this day. I was on a Singapore Airlines flight. They had the TV with the, you know, they had like, v, I must have been VCRs back then, but they had movies on board, right? Growing up, my, my parents didn't really let us watch very much TV. So I was on this flight and my brother and I were like jamming out about, okay, if we watch The Nutty Professor right now, then it'll be daylight after that and Dante's and Dante's peak after we were like planning out how to maximize the number of movies we could watch. We were over the moon excited. We were up the entire flight, land in India and go straight to bed because watching it was so amazing. Today, if you gave me a free ticket to a movie, I'd be like, ah, I'm kind of busy. Not today. Movies have lost any value for me. And it's because they're at your fingertips, like streaming on demand, right? There's a philosophy or there's like there's a psychological component to this where the amount of content in the world just makes everything less meaningful or valuable, right? I couldn't tell you a movie I watched this year, but I remember that moment in my life from 30 years ago, right? Or 28 years ago. And so with, I, I kind of see this world where Twitter posts are gonna be like, we all wanna be active on Twitter. We wanna grow our socials, right? Imagine that we're all gonna be using AI to generate posts and stuff. And there's gonna be just a ton of tweets and Instagram stuff and tick, like all this content. Just imagine like there's a proliferation of content that's like, you know, unimaginable, right? Uh, 10x, 100x, something like that. Then you're just going to swipe that much quicker. Um, there's like a psychology to like the meaningfulness is like the struggle, the hardship, right? The harder something is, you watched those movies back in the day because you knew what George Lucas must have been trying to do to make Star Wars. I mean, that to me, compared to like being able to do things so much more quickly now, there's like a I don't know, maybe this is like the, the old school in me, but like there's a, like the hardship is kind of the value of something. That's why we still value beautiful paintings that take a, a person, you know, 200 hours to produce. Do, is there like a correlation between the quality of work or the time required and the value? And what does that do for the economy? Like what, what will 
what a YouTube video worth tomorrow? Is it going to be? Are we going to make the same ad revenue? Or what? What is the economic consideration and the psychology of it? I, I was gonna. I agree with you completely on this. Um, I like your point. Your time take because it's supply and demand. It's like you have too much supply, not enough demand. Price drops. And it's like that's what we're going to be seeing. There's going to be like this flood of content that's just coming at us. It's it's already an avalanche and it's going to get worse. And it's just we're living in a world of plenty where there's so much it just loses all of its value. So that's kind of where my concern comes in for this is that it is making things it's going to it's going to improve things. It's going to improve a lot of things with our jobs like what we've been talking about. But then there's this kind of like human aspect to how this is going to roll out over the next coming years. That I don't know if anybody can really predict what's going to happen, but I am very concerned that we're going to be devaluing all of this content, all of this not just artwork, but just everything we do. We're kind of devaluing a lot of these skills and a lot of these things that we create because it's going to be so easy to make it. It's like, in one hand, okay, there's something that could be cool that comes out of that. On the other hand, holy crap, look, think about all the people who are going to lose their jobs. Uh, what are they going to do after they lose those jobs? How are we going to like put things like transparency into place so we understand how these things actually work? Uh, what guidelines are we going to put in place to make sure that everything's kind of on some kind of rails so that somebody's not doing something completely unethical like misinformation and oh my god we haven't even talked about misinformation like computer yes. oh my god like <laughs> you could create a a, a, a two-bit da vinci video that looks like you on screen talking and it's not you it's like that is what we understand as truth is going to just evaporate um it's very disturbing so like it's, it's like that's part of the reason why I was a big fan of this open letter of like, can we take a pause? Can we just have some kind of like could the industry itself kind of come out and say, here's our recommendations for what we need to do? It's like I'm not talking about like having laws had to be put in place today, but it feels like we need to have the people who are doing the work, doing the research that are building these tools, try to come together and come up with their best practices of what they think needs to happen as a recommendation. Because holy cow, um, the supply and demand issue is just going to devalue everything. So there, there's definitely there, there's a uh, a bias question we'll get to in a second, but I want to turn to our financial guru Alex and how does this Im impact like economies like right? I mean everything's going to be just not that valuable anymore. Like I could probably go on and you know build me a little web applet on my website that'll do X, Y, and Z, and I, I might be able to get a prompt and write the code instead of hiring a developer at hundred dollars an hour, right? And that sounds so cool to me right now, but then you kind of think upstream. What does this do to the, to the economy? Yeah, I think it just, so like, there's this notion of a commodity, right? So like, I, I respect that argument, but I don't agree with it. And it's like, this is very subjective. I just want to be super clear. We're in the very early innings. You know, uh, the point made about the diffusion model was a great one. And maybe some of the some of the limitations on what we can do in the letter is like, hey, this sounds like a great idea in the letter, but the computer science doesn't really allow it because of the way we're actually even generating these images. So all of those things, I think, will come to light as we sort of have more of these nuanced conversations. So I'm glad we're having it, right? But let me let me give you sort of like two two different answers to like that question, right? So I think it'll devalue a lot of things as long as those things are the same. So when you say it'll devalue all YouTube videos, what you're really saying is the skill floor for creating a video just got way, way lower, right? So the bottom videos, the videos that can do the minimum and still get views got lower, right? But just like you can go to a restaurant and you can have an awesome meal, even though most of the things that went into that meal are an absolute commodity, meat, rice, milk, butter, it's something about the way that chef combined those ingredients that raises its value, right? So that human element is just going to change everything. So, you know, don't think about the commodity level, hey, a YouTube video, think about your YouTube videos, think about that awesome steak dinner or whatever your favorite meal is. That's not going to get devalued, it might get more competitive, but then people are going to have to find new ways to innovate, just like they did when people moved from stone ovens and fires to like industrial kitchens with the latest gadgets, right? You know, there have been big transformational equivalents in every aspect of society, right? So I don't think it's supply and demand. I'll give you another example. Web apps, there's way more demand than there's supply for web apps, right? Like there are tons and tons of software demand that's not being met because we just don't have enough data scientists and computer engineers to meet it all, right? So all of a sudden, 
we're gonna have a lot more cool apps that do exactly what we needed to do. I'll give you a third example real quick. I have a buddy, he has two kids, right? And he can't find the bedtime stories that he wants to tell his kids. They're like, hey, I wanna hear a story about Spider-Man and Batman fighting. And it's like, you can't find that on the internet. They're not made by the same company. You know what I mean? Like there's tons and tons of illegalities and copyright about that. You go spit that into ChatGPT and you get a perfect story about Spider-Man fighting Batman. Cause like ChatGPT doesn't care. It'll give you whatever story you want, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden you're creating your own content. You're like, uh, I'm just gonna create this prompt based on what my kid wants tonight. And I'm gonna get a bedtime story that's like custom to them. So I think the answer is less about, what, what point am I trying to make? It's less about the commodity level of, yeah, there's gonna be a million more YouTube videos. And it's more about that, hey man, you're about to get the exact experience you want because somebody else will be able to generate that for you, you know, at that fine level because it's getting so cheap to make things hyper-personalized or things are getting so simple to hyper-personalize that you'll be able to do it yourself. And I think that's the right way to think about this. You're gonna become a 10X <laughs> bedtime story engineer you're, because you're, you're gonna be able to interface with the chat GPT that gives it to you. Like, okay. Can I say your 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 um your story there about the the time story? It's exactly my problem. My what? brother writes children's books, and you just oh, basically man. put my brother out of a job. So okay, my brother, well, well, why so can't he write a hundred of them now? Like, uh, why? But, He's in a perfect spot to make that prompt and make a whole series in the time it took him to make the, one book. But the fact that let's say you write a, a kind of a mid like you know a twelve year old kind of age book, and it takes you two years to craft yeah. that book, and then an AI writes you a similar story in 15 minutes and reads it to you every night before you go to bed. Mm -mm. My brother's no, no, not going to no. be able to keep doing that. He can't No, compete. no, no. No, because so like, he knows exactly what it takes to write a good book, right? He's going to make way better prompts than somebody coming in without that knowledge. You still need real industrial knowledge to get the most out of these tools. You, like for Midjourney, you know, people are copying and pasting things from Twitter, but the real innovators are people who understand photography, who understand composition, who know how to tell Midjourney to do all these like really fine detailed things to get the exact look they want. There are people who understand art. There are people who understand composition. They're, those are the people that are making the most out of Midjourney, not the average like guy who's like, cool, I use Discord and I know how to hit a like image generation button, right? Same thing for ChatGPT. Hey, I know exactly the elements that go into a great children's story. Craft me a hundred of them with this secret sauce, right? He's not so, being able to put out of a job. He's about to become the most prolific children's author of all time. Okay, so to, let, let's use that analogy right there. I, I hear you, Alex, and I think that there's, you know, there, that's a good cause for, for some optimism. But the reality is there's only so many children so if what you're saying happens and now, you know, Sean Farrell is making a hundred children's books. So each book now is worth what? Is he selling them for $10 or $12? No, because yep. uh, there's so there, there's a flood of them because every author is doing this. Now, Barnes and Nobles or the Kindle online store is flooded with children's stories, all slightly whatever, right? So there's no way he's going to make as much per. Also, if I'm hiring a writer and he says, oh, it'll be, you know, it'll be $1,000, I'll I'll say, are you crazy? I can get a hundred scripts for, you know, ten dollars because that's there's so much, you know, supply of these other writers, people using these tools. So there's a dilution. So if you thought you saved time because you can make so many more books, yeah, but there's a chance you'll make way less money per book. And then what are we're just kind of we're going from like a pre quantity over qu uh, sorry quality over quantity to the uh, to the inverse. And I'm I'm not sure again what that does to markets or what that does to the demand for anything like children's books or Disney movies. Disney is a company I've, I, I do not like Disney. Um, if I make that pretty known to people, uh, they're just, they, they're not artists. They just, they're a mill. That's, uh, that's why I don't watch any of these Marvel movies. They're all just nonsense regurgitated over and over again. They're gonna have a field day with this. We're gonna have like 800 Spider-Man movies a year, 1200 Iron Man's right. Um, but who's gonna watch them? I'm not gonna watch all 800 of them or whatever. And I'm not gonna pay $25 to watch. I don't know what it does to the fundamental like foundation of business. Yeah. You know that there's a there's a question of that. I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't predict the future. I don't know. I think it's going to do the exact opposite of what you think it's going to do. Where it's not going to be 800 Spider-Man movies. It's now I can take a lot more risks with my Spider-Man movie because my margins got a lot higher. I can release it in 12 languages at once. I can spend money on five really great VFX engineers who understand these new tools instead of 500. So now I can say, hey, what are all the deep, dark stories we want to tell? What are all the 
stories that we used to be afraid to tell because it wouldn't be a mass market mainstream story? What are all the groups that got marginalized because there wasn't enough of them to cater to that market? Now we can afford to tell those stories. Now we can afford to go on tangents and alternate universes and alternate timelines because now we're making enough money where it's like, oh, you know, the budget for this movie, instead of a million bucks, maybe it's 200,000, you know? So we only need half the money to break even, which means we can tell riskier stories and more exciting stories. We can make two versions, one that's R and one that's PG-13, because we have a few tools that will just replace certain pieces of dialogue, <laughs> words, alternate languages. Like, think about the margin expansion, not the... Sure. But it sounds like a, then it sounds like a, Studio Ghibli does this too, and so does DC, and so does yeah. Sony. And there's, there, I wish Studio Ghibli taking, made ten times more stories than they made. Oh, I, I wish that too. I would watch them all. Well, That's, uh, <laughs> this is this is well. Okay, no, 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 this is this is a race to the bottom. This is it's de devaluing. I, it's I don't totally agree. De oh, it's totally devaluing the agree. content because there's one benefit. Like, there's a societal benefit. Like the reason that theater, like going to a play or a musical. It's a communal experience you're all sharing on one story. And what you're talking about is having a million fractured stories that are tailored to you as an individual. And at that point, we are no longer sharing a common story of humanity. And we're all just in our own little isolated boxes, crafting our own little stories, and we have no connection to each other anymore. It's devaluating, it's devaluating everything. So it's like, I'm coming out of this from a very artistic point of view. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I find yeah. this like a lack of humanity and soul. And this is not a good place we're going to be going. It's like adding more to it is not the answer. That's 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 quantity over quality is not the answer. This is apples is and oranges, man. Like, <laughs> you know, when you go to a museum and you want to appreciate the same art as other people, that's still a great market. I don't think that's going away. The physical painters, you know, the physical playwrights and plays. Like I saw Book of Mormon with a whole bunch of friends eight years ago and we still talk about it. That's not changing. You know, that will never get commoditized for exactly the reason you said, shared experiences, right? Escape rooms, movie nights, blah, blah, blah. It's more about the people you go with than the thing you're actually doing. This isn't that. This is, hey, I just need a quick fix to tell my kid a bedtime story that involves Batman and Spider-Man at the same time <laughs> to put them to bed. I don't really care about the details. <clears throat> Let's go, right? Like, you know, I think when it comes to those bespoke human shared core experiences, those late night conversations with your buddies, the drinks, you know, super 2 a.m., end of a long Vegas trip, whatever. This isn't replacing that, and it's not trying to. It's trying to take out the mechanics and the labor out of digital work. Not, so really quick. You know, yeah, go ahead. Not to, really quick, there are a couple of super chats I want to thank. Norman Robinson, thank you so much for your super chat. He says, where or who has developed a definitive authorized book on effective prompting for GPT? and uh, AI platforms. I'm down to pay for that right now. I'm and working on that gets... right now. <laughs> I'm working on that right now. <laughs> Alex, Alex used a term I'd never heard. Uh, what was it? Prompt engineer? Yeah. Prompt engineer. Right. That's huge. That's the next generation of computer okay. scientists. For yeah, sure. it is. So that's interesting. And Lawrence McGill, I appreciate you as well. There's no comment, but Lawrence uh, has a super chat. Thank you so much. The, I, I, I think this really does get to the heart of it. So, you know, there's these, to your point about taking more risk, I kind of like that, right? I mean, if you, for example, there's all that talk. I'm not a big Spider-Man fan, so I don't know where we're at with this, but uh, black Spider-Man, like Spider-Man should be black. And now they could do both. But to Matt's point, what if there was a white Spider-Man and a black Spider-Man and you watch which one you want to watch and now everything about the world becomes our own little echo chambers or to the communal experience part. Um, this gets to something I was thinking about what has value, right? As I feel more and more useless every day, <laughs> I, I think about this. Like if I want to have a job, if I want to be able to feed my family in 10 years, like I got to be relevant. I have to have something of value. And I've thought about like what has value today. First of all, live sports. If you want, you want to know the one thing I think will be like very safe and around live sports. Like I was watching the final four. Uh, San Diego State University, go Aztecs, right? We're, we're, in the, we're in the championship game. And that was an amazing experience. And I walked around, went for a walk. Every neighbor was talking about it. It was amazing. It was a communal thing. I, I didn't watch my version. There's just, there's just one. Uh, live sports are really good. I just thought about this. Musicals, to Matt's point, uh, the last musical I watched, I think, was Hamilton. And it was absolutely incredible. And I don't think that's going away either because, again, that's the communal component of it. So we, I think what we're doing is we're making some things way more valuable than others. And, and Alex might disagree with this part. But 
Really quick, I wanted to get your take on something that I've I've been thinking about a lot because I get people who ask me for advice uh, about, for example, college. I think in America, we've moved to a service based economy. This has been happening for a while. We don't make anything. We outsource everything. We can't, you know, can't be bothered to pay $20 for something because we can make it in China for five. And so now we're a service economy. We, we've made so many jobs that I think are kind of going to be the first to get cut now with with AI, right? We mentioned some of those like secretarial kinds of things, these like pseudo professional jobs that you go to college for. Um, you know who's not going away? Electricians, plumbers. If you if you ask me like what are the most secure jobs, what can you do to not be a, be a plumber or an electrician? If you've ever I do a fair bit of electrical work, I see the people who do it. There's so much like custom new it's all just a bunch of making crap work. That'll be the last things that will automate away with robots and stuff. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it'll be very difficult. But there's so many jobs that are easily replaceable. Um, you know, there's going to be, is college even more of a waste of money now? <laughs> right? Because those trades jobs, like the jobs I keep thinking are going to be safer are the ones that don't require it. And as the, the costs continue to balloon, I struggle with this. But I mean, like, what, what, what would you tell a 18-year-old kid? Uh, Matt and Alex, what would you tell an 18 year old kid that goes, I, I don't know what's going on in the world. I don't understand my part in it. How do I have a successful life? Like, what should I do? What would you, what would you tell a kid like that? You want to start Matt or you want me to take you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> so my, my, my answer is panic. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but, so just to be clear, that panic doesn't stop when you turn 18. It actually gets way worse. Um, so uh, I've actually been thinking this, uh, about this a lot because, you know, as a guy who loves AI and has existential crises all the time, right? Like, um, here, here's what I think I would tell absolutely anyone and everyone about success. I think it boils down to one simple formula. I'm a guy who loves formulas, by the way. So, you know, anyone who prescribes a formula for success probably has it wrong. But here, here's my best shot, right? There's three parts to this formula. The first is how big of an impact can you make, right? Like, is what you're doing, whatever value you're considering adding, really impactful? Is it really changing somebody's life? At the end of the day, all business is person to person, right? You're buying a product from a business. That business is made out of people who have worked hard to add value for you for that product, right? Think about YouTube, whatever. It's made by people, right? So level one is impact. Is what you're doing, is it gonna matter to somebody? The second part of the formula is scale. Is it gonna to matter to a lot of people? Are you solving one person's problem or are you solving 10 million people's problem? And the beauty of the internet is if you're solving a problem for one person, chances are 10 million people have it if it's a real problem. And so the internet will find the right 10 million to get in front of your solution and that's how you have a business. But the third part is the part that's getting attacked now. So there's the depth of the value, the impact. There's the, um, you know, the the size of the scale of the impact that you're making, how many people, and then the denominator is how replaceable you are at doing that. If I can just get that solution from Starbucks for cheaper, you don't have a good solution. You're not unique. You're just another cup of coffee. You're a commodity. And that's what we're talking about now is what we're realizing is a lot of these new tools are commoditizing things that used to be bespoke. They used to be like, hey, you can only go to this one place to get this one type of painting, this one type of style, now everyone can recreate it. This one type of research, now everyone can recreate it. This one type of writing, imagery, whatever. So that replaceability is the third piece. So the reason to go to college is to think about a problem. To learn, First of all, it's to learn how to think. So I'm a big believer if you're going for hard sciences, physics, engineering, math, the STEMs, you're gonna be okay. Not because those jobs won't get automated or whatever, but because it'll teach you how to think about hard, complicated problems in a way that helps you identify where you can add value in a scalable way that's hard to replace, right? And those are the three keys to success. So if I was 18 and I was picking a major, it'd be electrical engineering, it'd be computer science, it would be something that helped me build frameworks and mental models to learn how to attack complex problems by breaking them up, by solving them chunk by chunk, and then integrating them back together. So scale, impact, irreplaceability. Those are the three key things to success, in my opinion. <laughs> like my, my reaction was just a few years ago, people would ask me this exact question. Like people who were graduating high school, it's like, well, what should I study? Um, one of these people is my nephew. It's like, 
I would, one of my go-tos was always, I used to work in the software industry. I wasn't a computer engineer, software engineer, but I worked on the user experience and design side. I was always, there was always a shortage of computer engineers, always. Like you find a good computer engineer, you pay them whatever they want because they're worth their weight in gold. And so it's like, if you want to have a job security, computer engineering, if you ask me today, that would not be my answer because I can go right. to chat GBT and say, could you write me a little bit of JavaScript that does X, Y, and Z? And it will just spit it out and I can paste it on my website and it does what I want. So it's like, I don't think software engineering is necessarily a great job security 10 years from now because of the way this stuff is evolving. So I, I actually, I have no recommendation. I, I, I like the way you're thinking about it, Alex, of like you're trying to kind of piece together what can I bring in value that can't be easily replaced. And I'm also a big proponent of college to me is not about the exact major you choose. It's about learning how to think and how to create yeah. a problem solving. So it's like, I know so many people that have their major was philosophy and now they're doing something in business that has nothing to do with philosophy, but the way they, what they, how they learn to think in college applies to what they're doing in their job. Yeah. So it's like, for me, it's not the exact major. It's more about just pick something that can m teach you how to think and be better at what you want to do and apply it to whatever else you go to in the future. Uh, so it's not about the major, it's more about the, the, the line of thinking. Yeah. And I'll just put the only thing I, so I totally agree with you. And the only thing I'll push back on is the nature of computer science. Like when you say, Hey, I'm not sure what to recommend anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the nature of computer science will change. It used to be punch cards right in the very beginning. And then it used to be very low level languages. And then it was things like C and JavaScript. And now it's going to be things like prompt engineering. You mm -hmm. know, it's the, the nature of these sciences will change at just like the nature of calculus and math changed with the advent of the calculator and then the smartphone and then the next thing and then the next thing, right? Like, so these aren't static fields either. So you wanna pick a field where they're embracing modern technology, right? One of the worst things you can do is, I think become somebody who does like art history or a specialized part of art, not because those aren't valuable, but because the market for those things is shrinking and they're being replaced more by more convenient forms of art, more convenient mediums, more convenient ways of distribution and all that, right? So it's like working for a print magazine now is probably a dangerous idea because so much of that is being digitized and distributed for free. So you got to really think about, to Matt's point, hey, what major do I think will adapt the quickest as new technologies come out? Like maybe I shouldn't be beholden to a certain language or piece of software or whatever, maybe I should be focused on learning how to think in a way that translates to many different areas. So there's <clears throat> a really interesting point, Matt, about what you would recommend and why maybe software isn't. So I had the same thing. My background is actually mechanical engineering, but I, after about 10 years as a mechanical engineer, I switched to about 10 years of software. And my, 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 my advice for everybody was always go get into software, the pay is is really, really good. And I'm not sure I think that way now. And I think part of the reason for that is if you compare, like I always say real engineering is like mechanical engineering, aerospace, and then there's software engineers. I don't really think, I don't think of that as an engineering discipline. Um, and the reason I say that is because in, in software, the, there's a running joke and a running meme. Everyone knows this. It's like what people think software engineers do. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's like some hacker in a, in a terminal and it's all crazy. <laughs> and then the reality Copy is based. like, it's a dude in front of Stack Overflow, Googling stuff and like downloading common libraries, right? We, we have, there's, we've been entered a world where software engineering has gotten so easy. I remember I, I got into software with iPhone. So iOS 2 comes out and you had to manage memory manually. It was a nightmare. Objective-C back then was a language that the, the barrier to entry was massive. Today, we have Swift. It is a breeze. It's really easy, right? And more and more of the things that you'd have to custom build is all automatic now, like asynchronous image downloading to build the next Twitter app. Everything is way, way easier, but we're still paying software engineers like it's not, right? There's, I know people at Google and Microsoft, not uh, Google and Facebook that are making three quarters of a million dollars a year as like a, a senior engineer, right? I think that is going to change because I think that will be much easier to just have an architect. So the architect is a person who kind of underlines like what the code should look like. Here's how we're going to like isolate different things, have good security, good practices, and then just have a bunch of prompt engineers or whatever to start making this code much quicker because 
that'll be much easier than imagine like an aerospace engineer. You're going to be all right because a lot of that is trial. It's flight testing. It's like, like systems integration. There's stuff that is vastly more complicated. And this gets to kind of like uh, Alex is shaking his head. I don't know if he... <laughs> I'm but not on I, camera. I, Sorry, I was shaking my head. Oh, yeah. to, to, just to be clear, I was shaking my head sure. off camera. Uh, like, yeah. You so, were. I, I wasn't yeah. curious if you agree or disagree, but I, I think like aerospace engineering, like you were a rocket scientist. Those jobs require a, a certain level of like physical world, like practical testing. It's not just all simulation. And there is a bit of that, but you have to, you got to go put it through a flight and come back and, and figure out if that landing gear does in fact uh, work or not, right? There's, there's a certain component to that that's a little bit harder to, to AI your way out of. Agree, disagree? I'm not sure. You, you, what do you think? Uh, without, I, I mean, I don't know how long this this podcast is going. I'm happy to be here forever. But like, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think what happens okay. is software lets us a handle way more complex problems. You know, like you're you're never going to run out of things to ramp up on on software. So I think you know, for basic things, you might be right. Like, create me a little the next the n plus one. Uh, you know, web app or the N plus one game on the app store or whatever, sure. But the really hard stuff, like I think you can't get enough 10X engineers to solve some of the biggest problems that are out there, right? And by the same token, you know, software is what you lets you test the landing year digitally a million times in a million different iterations before choosing the one that you go test physically, right? So like being able to use ChatGPT to iterate on a million different tests now as compute costs go to zero, as generating all these different uh, variations of different landing gears goes to zero because you don't have to make each one by hand anymore. That's still mm -hmm. valuable work, right? That's the step before the real testing. So I, I think there's like real hard engineering jobs, the physical engineering's, but I think that software engineering, I think that computer electrical engineering, those, those are real engineering. Like just because you're talking about bits instead of atoms doesn't mean those aren't uh, tough, challenging, you know, rewarding jobs in their own right is what I'll say. My there's, opinion, there's, opinion, not fact. No, no, I, no, I, 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 I did. I was in both worlds. I completely hear that. Uh, that, that. That's a very, very good point. There's a common thread that it's been. I've been meaning to bring it up and I'm trying to find out who the first person who brought this up. But there's, <laughs> if you play this out to the inevitable, you know, the eventuality of it all, I think what most people are are alluding to is life will be like Wally, -E, right? There'll be a bunch of yeah. fat fatzos and <laughs> yeah. chairs with TVs doing nothing and getting, yep. you know, living a comfortable life for some reason, right? And the argument that's being made is we need a UBI, universal basic income, because there is going to be people with nothing to do. And I think, is that the goal of civilization? Ultimately, is the end game of civilization that you don't need to go to work. You just have a comfortable life. You get paid from the pool of, you know, being an American citizen means you get like, instead of you know what a crazy idea instead of running a deficit every year what if we run a surplus and we collected all this money and then you know being an american was actually a was a was something that got you paid right is that something that you think will factor into the future or is are we way off uh me or matt let's go with matt let's go with matt first i was gonna say this is very star trek what you're talking about right yes. now because it's like so there was a star lot trek, of that. money has no that. meaning in the future everybody can just do whatever they want because computers are taking care of everything robotics are taking care of everything so it allows us to find our our inner light what do we want to do it's like i'm going to go explore the galaxy or i'm going to become a wine i'm going to make wine in a vineyard and that's what i want to do so it's like i think in an optimistic rosy future that's where we could head <laughs> with the, with this kind of stuff it's going to start to unlock that but then the question is, like, as these AIs start to become, I don't know, racing toward the singularity, when they start to become self-aware, at what point is it no longer, we're, ben we're, we're profiting off the backs of computers to, it's almost like slavery, where you've got this, <laughs> basically we have these AI self-aware things that are doing things for our behalf on our beck and call. It's like, and they don't have their own free will because we have them locked down. It's like... I don't know. We could take this. We could take this in big philosophical directions. <laughs> it's like there's, there's. This is a. You're talking about like hundred years in the future. It's like it could go any different direction um, on this. You what think it's you, that far away? Like this will not be something to think about in five years' time. I don't think so. I don't think it's that soon. But I do think okay. something like the uh, universal basic income is something we're going to have to grapple with and figure out if we want to do because this is going to start to impact people in ways just like that where people are not going to be able to make ends meet because they don't have the skills and robotics are taking their jobs and these 
AIs are taking their jobs and what do we do? We're going to have to figure something out. Like the profits that are made from those machines should probably be funneled right back into the people that are losing those jobs and helping to support people and give something a, a base level so that nobody's just out of luck. Um, but again, that's a very <laughs> third rail political conversation we're venturing into right now. Definitely, definitely. Norman Robinson, again, thank you for another super chat. He says, UBI works within a Star Trek future, which is why I support SpaceX. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. Alex had a video on, on SpaceX recently, which was really cool. You can check out as well. Yeah, I, I really want to thank you guys. I think we can probably start to wrap this up because I, I actually feel better, worse better or worse? I don't know. I kind of go back and forth a little bit. But I think this is really important. I don't think we should avoid it. And I think you will hear me talking about this a little bit more because I don't want to have to limit my channel to only uh, sustainability. If this is what people are thinking about and this is what you, you're, you know, keeping you up at night, why shouldn't we cover it? So maybe we'll, we'll talk about this on occasion when, when there's reason to. But I don't want to leave on a, on a, on a sour note. So why don't, we, why don't we close with something positive? I don't even know if it has to be about AI, maybe just general life, you know. Um, I'm a firm believer that this is the greatest time in human history ever to be, have been alive. I know a lot of people get nostalgic for the past, but the numbers tell a very clear story. Like, we live in the absolutely best of times today. I don't know about tomorrow. Let's end on a high note and talk about something positive, AI or otherwise, I think. Alex, let's start with you. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sticking to that this AI is a big net positive. So for me, the way I like to think about it is it's super cool that our generation specifically, like when I grew up, it was before dial-up even, right? So like I remember getting my first modem, then playing my first online game, and then mm -hmm. having access to a good computer, and then my phone got smarter, and then all these things happen, right? So I think the amount of value that we're kind of seeing happen right now is just through the roofs. And it, it, the reason it's exciting is because it's new. You're on the ground floor, right? When the iPhone came out and all the stuff came out, we were all still pretty young. I didn't get to be a software engineer or be able to add value as an adult in the era of the iPhone coming up. But now we're, we find ourselves on the ground floor of this whole new technology where it's still uncharted territory. We're back on a new frontier and it's up to us to add value and like, this is, could be one of those like rare moments in human history. The next time could be like when space launches are available to everyone and the first mechanics on spaceships become like a real job you can get, right? So like I would encourage everyone to leave this conversation with how can I use these tools for myself and for my friends and do something cool with it that I didn't have any experience to do before. Maybe I can finally make that little video game I've always wanted to play, but I didn't have the knowledge of how to do it. ChatGPT can kind of handle the 90% and I can finally do that cool thing. So I think, I think we're in uncharted territory in a good way. And, you know, if you were longing for, you know, being a part of the frontier in the 1800s and exploring and staking your name for yourself, now's a good time to think about how to do that digitally. So that's what I'm excited about. Before Matt jumps in, Alex, do you want to tell our viewers maybe, like for people who've been afraid or put, had their head in the sand, first of all, don't do that. Like whatever comes, we should always embrace, look into, understand, learn, and find our place in it. You want to recommend services or resources to kind of get started so like imagine if there's a viewer who's never done anything before is there a service to sign up for for free or something to mess with this and start getting their feet wet sure yeah so i honestly recommend you start with chat gpt just because that's the thing that everybody's talking about so you can go to i believe it's just open aid open ai.com slash chat gpt or you know you can google it or whatever and you'll find it super quick uh and you can just test it out for free and like what I encourage you to do is, you know, do the same thing you would do on Google for a few searches, right? Like, hey, what is the score of blah, blah, blah? You know, same things you typically do. But then I want you to start talking to it like a human being, right? Like, hey, I want you to pretend you're Warren Buffett, blah, 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 blah. You know, add in the things that you really wanted to do and then ask it questions as if it was Warren Buffett or your favorite athlete or your favorite teacher, you know, online persona or whatever and see how different that experience is. Generate me a story, generate me, you know, help me answer this marketing question I've always wondered about. So that's a good way. And then for mid-journey, you can go to midjourney.com, I believe. Um, and you can try a few generations there for free. And then you can go to plenty of Discord communities, including my own, that have Discord bots, 
which lets you, you know, work within a channel to, you give it a prompt, it'll give you four results. You can ask it to modify one of those specific results. So plenty of Discord communities also offer access to Midjourney specifically. So that's mm. how you get to ChatGPT and Midjourney for image generation, so. Brilliant, all right, Matt, Great make us feel good. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> I, I'm with you, Ricky. It's like, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person for the future. I think there's a lot of huge potential ahead of us. And it's been, for me in my life, I've witnessed the birth of the home computer to, you know, the internet dial up, all that stuff. And every time, every one of these has come out has been a transformational change to society. And yeah, there's been bad stuff with it, but overall it's been a net positive. And this is, we're at the cusp right now of that happening again. And it's just like mind blowing to me that in my life, I have lived through so many things are so transformational to the future of humanity. I love science fiction. I love Star Trek. I love that bright, optimistic future. And I feel like we can get there. <laughs> if we're careful, we can get there. And my recommendation would be just to go out and play with ChatGPT, just like Alex said. It's like, you got to try this stuff. It blows my mind when I'm using it as a tool to do my job. It's incredible what I can do now in a fraction of the time. It's just mind blowing. You got to give it a shot because when you start to play with it, you start to see the true potential that's right. We're, right at our fingertips. We're so, so close to something amazing. Go try it out. So really quickly, the, there was another super chat from Lax Lifters, which I think is Mario, one of, a channel, one of our friends here at the channel. He says, my cousin who lives in Guatemala is using ChatGPT to help explain coding concepts in Spanish and is so good at breaking things down, even in Spanish. The, 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 the translation, uh, yeah, there's, that is a remarkable use case, right? I, there's going to be plenty of those for every bad use case as well. Yeah, I would, I would, I would kind of wrap this up with reading the comments. I can almost predict how young and old people are based on the comment. And I actually understand this because I don't know if you, Matt and Alex, you know, but I'm officially old now. I, I feel old. I feel it in my bones. <laughs> and I think what happens is when you're young, like, for example, the, I mentioned the iPhone moment. When the iPhone came out, I was a mechanical engineer. I went out that weekend when, when iOS 2 was released and there was an app store. I bought a MacBook, my first MacBook, uh, never looked back, started learning code on the weekends. And I, a couple, a couple years later, I, you know, got my first job as a developer. So I was young and I was brave and I saw this new thing and I knew the iPhone was going to be big. I just knew it was going to be a big deal. I doubled or tripled my salary in a couple of years and I was on the forefront of that. Now here I am and I feel less willing. Like I, I feel the inertia to want to get into this next world. And that's what age does to all of us, right? But I would fight back to the older viewers, to anybody really, uh, to Alex's point. I love Alex and Matt, both of you guys have had really good insights on some of the positives. Matt mentioned a couple of the use cases. Alex has laid out the, the, the thesis for why this is actually a great thing. Um, there's fear, there's whatever. But at the end of the day, we can't live in fear of uh, or, or, or nostalgia, like, oh, things were so good back then. No, they weren't. It was, you know, things were, we're remembering it in a rosy colored uh, tint. But the reality is, like, try to figure something out from something small. Like, if you're a writer, right, uh, and you're, you have a little bit of roadblock, take a paragraph and tell it to, you know, make this funnier. Like, Matt mentioned in a, in a video, yeah. I don't know if I should tell people this, but there was an introduction he was struggling with, and he took it and said, make this funnier. And it was like a weird dad knock knock joke and he's like no 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 more of a dry wit and it made a paragraph that was so good i think matt pretty much kept it i used that it. is <laughs> that's insane right so if if you feel like you're being replaced or you feel left out try to find a way to make this work and try to find your place in it and i think if you do that you'll have more of alex's perspective you'll feel positive now that's not to say there aren't very real dangers and very real concerns that we should all have Right. I mean, we mentioned like, you know, a hacker can use my voice and call my mom and tell them I'm in an accident. I need a thousand dollars. And this that literally happened, by the way. And we're already kind of at that point. So there's there's fears. But like try to find your way to to use some of these tools for good. And and um, I think everything starts with how you wake up in the morning. Like when you wake up in the morning, you get to bed. You got to just choose to be happy. You got to have that optimism. You got to try to find your own way. And then there's a self-fulfilling prophecy to it. And I, I want to thank both of you guys because I've kind of had my head in the sand a lot more uh, before you guys came along and told me all the cool ways you're using it. And that spurred this chat, it spurred this live stream. And I do personally feel way more 
at ease. I, I have a lot of concerns. I have a lot of questions and doubts and everything else, but I do have a curiosity now. How can I, yeah, my website could use a little sprucing up. Maybe I'll try that, right? There's, 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 a, there's a, a joy that I'm feeling now that I didn't have before. So I want to thank you guys for that. Hopefully for the people watching, there were some key insights and stuff. I want to thank you guys. I'm using a new tool and we were supposed to have chats and be able to show the chat on here. Uh, that didn't work out. We'll have to figure out what happened there, but we will try to go live a little more often. And when there's breakthroughs in this area, these are two people that I always lean on for, for stuff like this. So we'll, we'll get back together. We'll chat. We'll chat again soon. I want to thank all of you guys for watching. It really means a lot to us. Uh, we appreciate you. And I, you know, leave us your comments and stuff. We'll, we'll look through them and we'll make content accordingly. I know Alex will and head over to ticker symbol. You definitely, he's yes. literally covering this stuff. He, I think he made a video today, yesterday. Today, yep. But today, so like good. literally it's such today a good on video. Everybody needs to go watch a really that good video. video. It's really good. Yes. Thanks. And man. thank you, Alex and Matt. You know I love you guys. I appreciate you. Thanks for taking time out of your Sunday. And uh, we'll do this again <laughs> soon, man. Much love. Thanks for having us. Thanks around. for having us. Yeah.